Hello again, welcome back. Today, I would like to have some fun. I've been super busy at work recently, so rather than hitting you with another long form video essay, I want to just read one of my favorite chapters and talk about why I like it so much. It is chapter eight of book three. It's called The Road to Isengard, and it is a certified heat rock. This chapter in particular exemplifies most of the qualities that I most enjoy about Lord of the Rings, namely extended descriptive passages, Mwah! like that's what I'm here for, uh, lots of world building and history, and really good dialogue between characters that includes some subtle character building. The other thing I like about this chapter is the majority of it does not appear in the Peter Jackson movies. In my opinion, a lot of people kind of conflate the Peter Jackson movies with what the Lord of the Rings story is. Like, they're one and the same for a lot of people, and that's totally fair. It turns out that 9 to 12 hours of epic fantasy film is much easier to digest than this very long book. There's a lot in the books that makes for a much richer experience of engaging with Middle-earth, and I think this chapter has a lot of that goodness in it. I also think, especially in recent years, a lot of the fandom has kind of gotten away from or forgotten about actually enjoying the text that so many of us rally around and stand behind and call ourselves fans of. So that's what I want to do today. I am reading the 1999 HarperCollins edition. <laughs> So if you have this edition, please feel free to read along with me. I'm just gonna read a few passages and talk about them. I'm looking forward to having fun for like five minutes. So come sit next to me and let's do some good old fashioned reading. You asked for it. It's a whole video devoted to- The Road to Isengard. Oh, ah, oh, yes, yes. Overwhelm your friends. I could do this all night. In fact, this is a wonderful way to relax or get excited and then never go to sleep. So this chapter is fully in media res. It's the day after the Battle of Helm's Deep. Theoden and the men of Rohan have emerged victorious. Gandalf is there, Legolas and Gimli are comparing body counts of orcs that they've killed, Aragorn's chillin', and Gandalf is like, hey guys, I'm gonna go to Isengard. <laughs> uh, there's a wizard that I need to go deal with over there, and it would probably be cool if you came with me, <laughs> considering he has fucked up your entire situation. And Theoden kind of comes around to it after the burial of Hama, his captain. Hamas, son of Hama. He says, great injury indeed has Saruman done to me and all this land, and I will remember it when we meet. Basically saying, I won't hesitate, bitch. <laughs> so Theoden agrees to go with Gandalf and also brings 20 men with him, which seems like a lot of guys, but okay. Um, and obviously Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli will be going along as well. The other thing to note is that in the Deep in Coombe, which is the big field in front of Helm's Deep, Overnight, seemingly, a grove of strange trees has appeared. A bunch of orcs ran in there the night before and never came out. So the men of Rohan are understandably a little bit weirded out by this appearance of trees out of nowhere. <laughs> You'll have no trust on me because I like everything, but that's the fun of it. The riders came to the wood and they halted. Horse and man, they were unwilling to pass in. The trees were gray and menacing, and a shadow or a mist was about them. The ends of their long, sweeping boughs hung down like searching fingers. Their roots stood up from the ground like the limbs of strange monsters, and dark caverns opened beneath them. But Gandalf went forward, leading the company, and where the road from the Hornburg met the trees, they saw now an opening like an arched gate under mighty boughs. And through it Gandalf passed, and they followed him. Then, to their amazement, they found that the road ran on, and the deeping stream beside it, and the sky was open above and full of golden light. But on either side, the great aisles of the wood were already wrapped in dusk, stretching away into impenetrable shadows. And there they heard the creaking and groaning of boughs, and far cries, and a rumor of wordless voices murmuring angrily. No orc or other living creature could be seen. 
Legolas and Gimli were now riding together upon one horse. <gasps> okay, calm down, D. And they kept close beside Gandalf, for Gimli was afraid of the wood. It is hot in here, said Legolas to Gandalf. I feel a great wrath about me. Do you not feel the air throb in your ears? I love that description. The kind of claustrophobic closeness of riding through this hall of trees <laughs> where you can see the sky above and you can see a path forward, but on either side it is dark. It is angry. Like they can tell there's like a sinister kind of energy. The trees are pissed. Legolas is an empath for trees <laughs> and he's picking up on a, a great ire, like a deep anger. And I think that's part of what causes the men of Rohan to be so hesitant to ride into the trees. But because Gandalf is in the front and leading them forward, they follow him because they would follow Gandalf anywhere. He's like the coolest wizard. As they continue riding through the forest, Legolas and Gimli have a little chit chat. Legolas was ever glancing from side to side and would often have halted to listen to the sounds of the wood if Gimli had allowed it. These are the strangest trees that I ever saw, he said, and I have seen many an oak grow from acorn to ruinous age. I wish that there were leisure now to walk among them. They have voices and in time I might come to understand their thought." I love this. Like, Legolas is such a nerd for trees. Of course he is. He's a wood elf. I'm gonna show you what. But we get a little tiny bit of character development here. Uh, he's seen many an oak grow from acorn to ruinous age. Like, Legolas is old. Very old. <laughs> old as balls. He's like over 2,000 years old. Um, and again, he's a wood elf. He wants to get to know these trees. He wants to get to know their language and know their voices and learn their names. And I think it's really lovely that Tolkien's passion for language and communication is woven in and through pretty much every character in Lord of the Rings. And here's like a tiny hint of it from Legolas. They have voices and in time I might come to understand their thought. Like they have voices and they have a language of their own and would that I had the leisure time to learn it. <laughs> it's really lovely. And it leads into one of my favorite long descriptive passages <laughs> in the entire book. As Legolas is talking about how much he loves being in this claustrophobic little grove of weird trees, Gimli says, you may think them wonderful, but I have seen a greater wonder in this land, more beautiful than any grove or glade that ever grew. My heart is still full of it. So I'm just gonna read this whole passage, like strap in. <laughs> Pardon me. Oh, I just get so into it. Strange are the ways of men, Legolas. Here they have one of the marvels of the northern world, and what do they say of it? Caves, they say. Caves. Holes to fly to in times of war, to store fodder in. My good Legolas, do you know that the caverns of Helm's Deep are vast and beautiful? There would be an endless pilgrimage of dwarves merely to gaze at them, if such things were known to be. I indeed, they would pay pure gold for a brief glance. And I would give gold to be excused, said Legolas, and double to be let out if I strayed in. You have not seen, so I forgive your jest, said Gimli, but you speak like a fool. <laughs> Do you think those halls are fair where your king dwells under the hill in Mirkwood, and dwarves helped in their making long ago? They are but hovels compared with the caverns I have seen here immeasurable halls filled with an everlasting music of water that tinkles into pools, as fair as Kelad Zaram in the starlight. And Legolas, when the torches are kindled and men walk on the sandy floors under the echoing domes, ah, then Legolas, gems and crystals and veins of precious ore glint in the polished walls, and the light glows through folded marbles, shell-like, translucent as the living hands of Queen Galadriel. There are columns of white and saffron and dawn rose Legolas, fluted and twisted into dreamlike forms. They spring up from many colored floors to meet the glistening pendants of the roof. Wings, ropes, curtains fine as frozen clouds, spears, banners, pinnacles of suspended palaces. Still lakes mirror them. A glimmering world looks up from dark pools covered with clear glass. Cities such as the mind of Durin could scarce have imagined in his sleep 
stretch on through avenues and pillared courts, on into the dark recesses where no light can come. And plink, a silver drop falls, and the round wrinkles in the glass make all the towers bend and waver like weeds and corals in a grotto of the sea. Then evening comes, they fade and twinkle out, the torches pass on into another chamber and another dream. There is chamber after chamber, Legolas, hall opening out of hall, dome after dome, stair beyond stair, and still the winding paths lead on into the mountain's heart. Caves, the caverns of Helm's Deep, happy was the chance that drove me there. It makes me weep to leave them. Then I will wish you this fortune for your comfort, Gimli, said the elf, that you may come safe from war and return to see them again. But do not tell all your kindred. There seems little left for them to do from your account. Maybe the men of this land are wise to say little. One family of busy dwarves with hammer and chisel might mar more than they made. No, you do not understand, said Gimli. No dwarf could be unmoved by such loveliness. None of Durin's race would mine those caves for stones or ore, not if diamonds and gold could be got there. Do you cut down groves of blossoming trees in the springtime for firewood? We would tend these glades of flowering stone, not quarry them. With cautious skill, tap by tap. A small chip of rock and no more, perhaps, in a whole anxious day. So we could work, and as the years went by we should open up new ways, and display far chambers that are still dark, glimpsed only as a void beyond fissures in the rock. And lights, Legolas, we should make lights, such lamps as once shone in Kazadum, and when we wished we would drive away the night that has lain there since the hills were made, and when we desired rest, we would let the night return. You move me, Gimli, said Legolas. I've never heard you speak like this before. Almost you make me regret that I have not seen these caves. Come, let us make this bargain. If we both return safe out of the perils that await us, we will journey for a while together. You shall visit Fangorn with me, and then I will come with you to see Helm's Deep. <sighs> that would not be the way of return that I should choose, said Gimli, but I will endure Fangorn if I have your promise to come back to the caves and share their wonder with me. You have my promise, said Legolas. Oh my gosh. Oh, I love this. So not only is Gimli here giving us one of the best descriptive passages in the entire book, if you ask me, he's giving us a peek into how dwarves kind of see themselves. He speaks of the art and work of dwarves as a practice of enhancement rather than destruction, and how they see themselves as caretakers of the earth and of the rock. Legolas cannot help but be moved. He literally says, you move me, Gimli. And it's like, you know when your nerdy friend is explaining their favorite thing to you, like telling you all about it, and you don't necessarily get it, but you like them, and so you listen, and you learn something new about them, and you love them more for it? That's exactly what's happening with my boys right here. And then, <laughs> they make this amazing, like, honeymoon boys trip pact that if they both come out of the quest alive, they're going to visit these places that their respective peoples are not super fond of, but they're gonna have a great time because they're together. <laughs> like, we're gonna learn something new about each other, we're gonna appreciate the beauty of our world through the eyes of another. That's what love is. That's love. They're in love with each other. Now you see I'm not perfectly straight, does not matter. So when the company finally passes through the trees, Legolas kind of turns back, looks back, and goes, there are eyes, <laughs> eyes looking out from the shadows of the boughs. I never saw such eyes before. And he tries to ride back and Gimli's like, fuck no, absolutely not. And Gandalf's like, dude, stay, like chill, hang out, watch what happens. And even as he speaks, there come forward out of the trees, three strange shapes. As tall as trolls they were, 12 feet or more in height, their strong bodies, stout as young trees, seemed to be clad with raiment or with hide of close-fitting gray and brown. Their limbs were long, and their hands had many fingers. Their hair was stiff, and their beards gray-green as moss. They gazed out with solemn eyes, but they were not looking at the riders. Their eyes were bent northwards. 
Suddenly, they lifted their long hands to their mouths and sent forth ringing calls, clear as notes of a horn, but more musical and various. The calls were answered, and, turning again, the riders saw other creatures of the same kind approaching, striding through the grass. They came swiftly from the north, walking like waiting herons in their gait but not on their speed, for their legs and their long paces beat quicker than the herons' wings. The riders cried aloud in wonder, and some set their hands upon their sword hilts. "'You need no weapons,' said Gandalf. "'These are but herdsmen. They are not enemies, and indeed they are not concerned with us at all.' So it seemed to be, for, as he spoke, the tall creatures, without a glance at the riders, strode into the wood and vanished. "'Herdsmen,' said Theoden, "'where are their flocks? What are they, Gandalf? For it is plain that to you, at any rate, they are not strange.' "'They are the shepherds of the trees,' answered Gandalf. "'Is it so long since you listened to tales by the fireside? "'There are children in your land who, out of the twisted threads of story, "'could pick the answer to your question. "'You have seen Ents, O king, Ents out of Fangorn Forest, "'which in your tongue you call the Entwood. "'Did you think that the name was given only an idle fancy?' <sighs> "'Nay, Theoden, it is otherwise.' To them you are but the passing tale. All the years from Errol the young to Theoden the old are of little count to them, and all the deeds of your house but a small matter. <laughs> Gandalf! <laughs> that forest you call the Entwood, did you think that name was given only an idle fancy? Like, Theoden, bud, do you remember your history lessons? Do you remember your nursery rhymes? I love this from Gandalf. I love his stewardship of Middle-earth coming through. I could go on and on and on. But let's move on. The king was silent. Ents, he said at length. Out of the shadows of legend, I begin a little to understand the marvel of the trees, I think. I have lived to see strange days. Long we have tended our beasts and our fields, built our houses, wrought our tools, or ridden away to help in the wars of Minas Tirith, and that we called the life of men, the way of the world. We cared little for what lay beyond the borders of our land. Songs we have that tell of these things, but we are forgetting them, teaching them only to children, as a careless custom. And now the songs have come down among us out of strange places, and walk visible under the sun. You should be glad, Theoden King, said Gandalf. For not only the little life of men is now endangered, but the life also of those things which you have deemed the matter of legend. You are not without allies, even if you know them not. Yet, also, I should be sad, said Theoden. For however the fortune of war shall go, may it not so end that much that was fair and wonderful shall pass forever out of Middle-earth? It may, said Gandalf. The evil of Sauron cannot be wholly cured nor made as if it had not been. But to such days we are doomed. Let us now go on with the journey we have begun. This is so good. Like, this is the history and world building where Theoden is kind of mourning in real time the passing of Middle-earth. The third age is the twilight years of Middle-earth. And Theoden is realizing that he and the Rohirrim may have missed their chance to truly know the land that they call home, to like understand and know their neighbors. Theoden is learning just how little he and his people know about Middle Earth, and that's really great organic world building if you ask me, like being confronted with something that you thought was a myth <laughs> and realizing there's a lot that I don't know, even though I'm a king of my people, like that's humbling. <laughs> And we know that the Rohirrim tell stories and sing songs and have this oral tradition, and they have a history that includes fables and myths that are told to children, but are otherwise unthought of. Like, they've relegated these great and powerful legendary aspects of their world to children's stories, which is a little commentary, I think, from Tolkien on the nature of stories for children, but that's for a different video. Like, the Rohirrim are a proud and honorable people, but they're also small and insular, and they have so much to learn about Middle-earth, even though it's in decline and in its twilight years. Like, 
that's a bittersweet feeling, knowing that you've kind of undervalued and written off something of great beauty and gravity, especially when it's in your own backyard. And Theoden is feeling all of that right now. Theoden is realizing, like, so much that was fair and wonderful is passing forever out of Middle-earth. A lot of that has already happened. It's already gone. Um, but Gandalf is reinforcing, like, we're doing what we can to preserve that goodness, to save some of that beauty. Let's go forth. Like, let's keep it rocking. I just love it. All right, now it's time for another extended descriptive passage. And this is one where, this is in the movies, but indirectly. Like, this is what Orthanc looks like. There stood a tower of marvelous shape. It was fashioned by the builders of old, who smoothed the ring of Isengard. And yet it seemed a thing not made by the craft of men, but riven from the bones of the earth in the ancient torment of the hills. A peak and isle of rock it was, black and gleaming hard. Four mighty piers of many-sided stone were welded into one, but near the summit they opened into gaping horns, their pinnacles sharp as the points of spears, keen-edged as knives. Between them was a narrow space, and there upon a floor of polished stone, written with strange signs, a man might stand five hundred feet above the plain. This was Orthanc, the citadel of Saruman, the name of which had, by design or chance, a twofold meaning. For in the elvish speech, Orthanc signifies Mount Fang, but in the language of the mark of old, the cunning mind. A strong place and wonderful was Isengard, and long it had been beautiful, and there great lords had dwelt, the wardens of Gondor upon the west, and wise men that watched the stars. But Saruman had slowly shaped it to his shifting purposes, and made it better, as he thought, being deceived for all those arts and subtle devices for which he forsook his former wisdom, and which fondly he imagined were his own, came but from Mordor, so that what he made was not, only a little copy, a child's model or a slave's flattery, of that vast fortress, armory, prison, furnace of great power, Baradur, the Dark Tower, which suffered no rival, and laughed at flattery, biding its time, secure in its pride and its immeasurable strength. This was the stronghold of Saruman, as fame reported it, for within living memory the men of Rohan had not passed its gates, save perhaps a few such as Wormtongue, who came in secret and told no man what they saw." So from that description, I'm sure you understand that Peter Jackson totally killed it with what Orthanc looks like. Oh my god, like 100% A+, plus, my dude. Way to read. Also, side note, one of my favorite parts of the movies is when the Fellowship is on Karadras and Saruman is standing on top of Orthanc and he's like, <laughs> Never fails to make me laugh hysterically. It's very good. Christopher Lee, rest in peace. You were a gem and you are a legend. The other thing I really enjoy about this passage beyond things like riven from the bones of the earth in the ancient torment of the hills. The ancient torment of the hills. Harder than the sun. I, uh, I just love the description of how the dark tower of Baradur cares not for Saruman's like cheap imitation of that tower. Like it's built in its image, but Baradur's like, you can't touch this at all. Like, how dare you even try? You little stupid ass bitch, I ain't fucking with you. You little, you little dumb ass bitch. Ooh, like Baradur suffers no rival and laughs at flattery. This is what Sauron is doing to Saruman. Saruman thinks he's a player, he thinks he's a contender, and without even being named, <laughs> <laughs> it's very clear that Sauron sees Saruman as a pawn, not an equal. Mmm, it's so good! Oh my gosh! So now that we know what Orthanc looks like, the writers of the company notice that things are not looking great. <laughs> Isengard is flooded, it's smoking, it's steaming. And the king and all of his company sit silent on their horses, marveling, perceiving that this power of Saruman was overthrown, but how, they could not guess. And now they turned their eyes towards the archway and the ruined gates. 
There they saw close beside them a great rubble heap, and suddenly they were aware of two small figures lying on it at their ease, gray-clad, hardly to be seen among the stones. There were bottles and bowls and platters laid beside them, as if they had just eaten well and were now rested from their labor. One seemed asleep, the other, with crossed legs and arms behind his head, leaned back against a broken rock and sent from his mouth long wisps and little rings of thin blue smoke. And here come my boys. <laughs> here come my two favorite boys in the book, Merry and Pippin. And this is just another bit where I'm just gonna read it to you because it's all good. Like I have a really hard time picking passages. <laughs> so I'm just gonna read it. <laughs> Heavy. For a moment, Theoden and Eomer and all his men stared at them in wonder. Amid all the wreck of Isengard, this seemed to them the strangest sight. But before the king could speak, the small, smoke-breathing figure became suddenly aware of them as they sat there silent on the edge of the mist. He sprang to his feet. A young man he looked, or like one, though not much more than half a man in height. His head of brown curling hair was uncovered, but he was clad in a travel-stained cloak of the same hue and shape as the companions of Gandalf had worn when they rode to Edoras. He bowed very low, putting his hand upon his breast. Then, seeming not to observe the wizard and his friends, he turned to Eomer and the king. "'Welcome, my lords, to Isengard,' he said. "'We are the Door Wardens. Mariadoc, son of Saradoc, is my name, and my companion, who, alas, is overcome with weariness, here he gave the other a dig with his foot, is Peregrine, son of Paladin, of the House of Took. Far in the north is our home. The Lord Saruman is within, but at the moment he is closeted with one worm tongue, or doubtless he would be here to welcome such honorable guests. Doubtless he would, laughed Gandalf. And was it Saruman that ordered you to guard his damaged doors and watch for the arrival of guests when your attention could be spared from plate and bottle? No, good sir, the matter escaped him, answered Mary gravely. He has been much occupied. Our orders came from Treebeard, who has taken over the management of Isengard. He commanded me to welcome the Lord of Rohan with fitting words. I have done my best. Okay, just a couple things real quick. I love how Mary seems not to observe the wizard and his friends, the hunters who followed him and Pippin and tried to find them and rescue them for days and days and days. Mary's like, hang on a second. I've got a king to make a good impression on. Yes. Yes. And then I also love Mary speaking gravely, speaking with professional terms about how Saruman is much occupied and how Treebeard has taken over the management of Isengard. The hobbitry of it all. It's uh, it's very sassy. It feels very tongue-in-cheek to me. This is part of why I love hobbits so much. They just kind of bring good humor to every situation, even when it's a smoking wreck of a great fortress <laughs> that was held by one of the more powerful wizards in Middle-earth. I love how Mary is like... <laughs> he and Pippin are like the hobbit PR team. They're the only hobbit PR team. Oh, the only very news team. They're being so overly formal. <laughs> like, introducing him and Pippin with their full names. Uh, Mariadoc, son of Saradoc, Peregrine, son of Paladin. I just, I love, I love it. Mary is kind of lending him and Pippin a higher status, a higher title, in order to be like, yes, we are very grand king. I think it's very sweet. After he greets the Lord of Rohan with fitting words, having done his best, <laughs> Gimli pipes up. What about your companions? Hmm? What about Legolas and me? Cried Gimli, unable to contain himself longer. You rascals, you woolly footed and wool pated truants. A fine hunt you've led us. 200 leagues through fen and forest, battle and death to rescue you. And here we find you feasting and idling and smoking. Smoking! Where did you come by the weed, you villains? Hammer and tongs. I am so torn between rage and joy that if I do not burst, it will be a marvel. <laughs> Hammer and tongs? Come on. Is that how dwarves say shit and fuck? Where did you come by the weed, you villains? Does any one of you have any god damn weed? <laughs> come on now. You speak for me, Gimli, laughed Legolas, though I would sooner learn how they came by the wine. 
I love this. Like, Legolas and Gimli are like, great. The hobbits are here. They're fine. Let's get fucked up. They're so happy to see their little pals, but they're like so mad. <laughs> one thing you have not found in your hunting, and that's brighter wits, said Pippin, opening one eye. Here you find us sitting on a field of victory amid the plunder of armies, and you wonder how we came by a few well-earned comforts. Pippin's like, listen, bud, we haven't just been chilling and vibing. A, we stole all of this stuff, look around you. And B, we've been through it as well, my dude. Gimli says, well earned? I cannot believe that. And the riders laugh. It cannot be doubted that we witnessed the meeting of dear friends, said Theoden. So these are the lost ones of your company, Gandalf? The days are fated to be filled with marvels. Already I have seen many since I left my house, and now here before my eyes stand yet another of the folk of legend. Are not these the halflings that some among us call the Hobbitlan? 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 Hobbits, if you please, Lord, said Pippin. Hobbits, said Theoden. Your tongue is strangely changed, but the name sounds not unfitting so. Hobbits. No report that I have heard does justice to the truth. Mary bowed, and Pippin got up and bowed low. You are gracious, Lord, or I hope that I may so take your words. And here is another marvel. I have wandered in many lands since I left my home, and never till now have I found people that knew any story concerning hobbits. He said it. He said the name of the thing. He said concerning hobbits. I also love, you are gracious lord, or I hope that I may so take your words. Theoden says, nothing that I've heard does justice to the truth. Pippin's like, I hope that's a compliment. <laughs> are they incredible or what? My people came out of the north long ago, said Theoden, but I will not deceive you. We know no tales about hobbits. All that is said among us is that far away, over many hills and rivers, live the halfling folk that dwell in holes and sand dunes. But there are no legends of their deeds, for it is said that they do little and avoid the sight of men, being able to vanish in a twinkling, and they can change their voices to resemble the piping of birds. But it seems that more could be said. It could indeed, Lord, said Mary. Theoden's like, here's what I claim to know about you guys, but it seems like there's more to you than that. And Mary's like, yeah, we actually have rich in our lives. Thank you so much. Theoden goes on to say that he had not heard that they spouted smoke from their mouths, and Mary launches into a long kind of history of pipeweed, long bottom leaf, and old Toby. Gandalf warns Theoden of the danger that he's kind of wading into, saying, These hobbits will sit on the edge of ruin and discuss the pleasures of the table or the small doings of their fathers, grandfathers, and great grandfathers, and remoter cousins to the ninth degree if you encourage them with undue patience. Some other time would be more fitting for the history of smoking. Where's Treebeard, Mary? So Gandalf is clearly very impatient to see Treebeard. He notes the time, saying, It's past noon, and we at any rate have not eaten since early morning. Yet I wish to see Treebeard as soon as may be. Did he leave me no message, or has plate and bottle driven it from your mind? He left a message, said Mary, and I was coming to it, but I've been hindered by many other questions. I was to say that, if the Lord of the Mark and Gandalf will ride to the Northern Wall, they will find Treebeard there, and he will welcome them. I may add that they will also find food of the best there. It was discovered and selected by your humble servants." He bowed. And Gandalf laughed. That is better, he said. Well, Theoden, will you ride with me to find Treebeard? We must go round about, but it is not far. When you see Treebeard, you will learn much, for Treebeard is Fangorn, and the eldest and chief of the Ents. And when you speak with him, you will hear the speech of the oldest of all living things. I will come with you, said Theoden. Farewell, my hobbits. May we meet again in my house. There you shall sit beside me and tell me all that your hearts desire, the deeds of your grandsires as far as you can reckon them, and we will speak also of Tobold the Old and his herb lore. Farewell. I, I just love this. I love Theoden being like, yeah, sure, Gandalf, I'll go and visit the oldest of all living things with you. I'll learn much. I'll see strange things. I'll meet Treebeard with you, but... I would really love to schedule a play date with these little guys. Like, I want to hear about the herb lore. I want to hear them talk about weed. I want to hear them talk about their family trees. Can I invite them over to my house? <laughs> the kind of roots of the friendship between Mary and Theoden are 
evident here. Like, Mary is super excited to talk about herb lore because Theoden is excited to see hobbits smoking. It's like very unfamiliar to him. He's like, what is going on? Like, what are these little dudes all about? And that kind of like surprise and delight and enthusiasm is something that Mary latches on to and Theoden is more than happy to indulge him. I think it's so sweet. And their relationship becomes devastating for me personally, but we'll get to that. This chapter closes with the hobbits bowing low. So that's the King of Rohan, Pippin says in an undertone. A fine old fellow, very polite. And that's the road to Isengard. Oh my gosh, it's so um, great. It really, to me, kind of encapsulates and embodies the qualities that I find most satisfying about this book, about Lord of the Rings. The kind of subtle character development we get with Legolas and his age and his wisdom and his love of trees and their language and how they speak to one another. Gimli and the kind of caretaker role that the dwarves take on when it comes to fostering and tending the earth. The relationship between Legolas and Gimli. And then the the relationship of Theoden and the men of Rohan to their land and the world around them and how they're discovering that they're kind of insular and small and they don't actually know very much at all. This is a theme that we see repeated throughout the book. Hobbits are very insular. They don't know anything about the world around them. The men of Rohan are very similar in this way. The wide world is all around you. You can fence yourselves in, but you cannot forever fence it out. Theoden is realizing that he's been doing some fencing in and some fencing out, and he wants to get to know his neighbors. He wants to get to know the Ents. He wants to get to know the Hobbits. He wants to understand how much of the stuff of legend is actually alive and thriving and walking around in the world today even if that world is in decline. And then of course we have my boys, the only Hobbit PR team, Merry and Pippin, doing their thing, bringing the party, just bringing that kind of like lightness and good humor and happiness and sense of like things could be a lot better, but they could also be a lot worse. Like, yeah, sure, y'all just went through a huge battle and we were prisoners of war and we've just been hanging out with these very boring trees for a while but we've got all this food and drink here. We've got weed, we've got wine, we've got everything y'all need. Let's turn the party. This chapter in and of itself is a short rest. <laughs> we get some time to kind of take a breather after the Battle of Helm's Deep and before we get into Flotsam and Jetsam, which is a chapter where Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli and Merry and Pippin compare notes about what's been going on. So that's a lot of exposition. And this is really just like, a chance to kind of indulge ourselves and get to know the characters more and kind of rest up and recuperate and, you know, indulge in some enjoyment and some simple pleasure. <laughs> and again, like that to me is the point of this book of Lord of the Rings, is to have a good time, indulge in some escapism, and learn something new. <laughs> and that's what goes on in this chapter. The characters are learning new things, they're enjoying, kind of challenging their boundaries. Legolas and Gimli are challenging their boundaries. Gimli has to ride through a forest and Legolas has to endure a very long description of caves. The men of Rohan are being challenged by, again, the weird creepy forest that they have to ride through. And then also Theoden realizing that he doesn't know as much about the world as he thought he did or as he maybe should. And then, <laughs> <laughs> Merry and Pippin challenging Gandalf and going tete-a-tete, toe-to-toe with him in their little witty repartee <laughs> at the gates of Isengard, insisting that they make a good impression on the King of Rohan. Screw Gandalf, Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas, they're good friends who have followed them into certain peril <laughs> to try and rescue them. It's very sweet. and. Yeah, it just, it really makes my heart glow. I love this chapter. So thank you for reading with me and I will see you again soon. I'm hoping to make a video about Rings of Power <laughs> very shortly. And don't let that put you off. It may surprise you. So be good, but not too good. And I'll see you soon. Wow. <gasps>
Once you get started, it is so hard to stop.